Good morning to everyone in the Bailey Borough Group and welcome to this service of worship for Sunday the 9th of May 2021. A very important announcement is that all four Kirk sessions have agreed uh, that their buildings reopen uh, when government uh, restrictions lift on the 10th of May. That means services resume next weekend, God willing, at uh, 10.30am in Corglass and 12 noon in Irvey. The following Sunday then, the 23rd uh, of May, there'll be a service in Trinity uh, at 10.30 and Coronary at 12 noon. The service schedule uh, for the rest of 2021 has also been agreed by the Kirk Sessions and will be published in the coming days. Can I remind you that until further notice, you're asked to attend services only in the building uh, where, uh, which is your congregation, uh, and that is just because of the restrictions on space um, uh, created by the social distancing. Uh, so please only attend services in your own building uh, until uh, further notice. But there still will be uh, online uh, content uh, for you uh, to watch uh, and to continue to take time to worship God each week. Uh, and uh, we'll keep you updated uh, on that. The only other announcement is that the prayer meeting continues on Zoom this Thursday evening at 8pm and the login details are as usual. And if anyone does require pastoral assistance, please do not hesitate to contact me. The hymns for today are linked in the email and please do use them as part of your worship. Our call to worship comes from the opening verses of Isaiah 55, where we hear the invitation. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come, take your choice of wine or milk, it's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest foods. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. Let us pray. Lord our God, we come to worship you today and to exalt your holy name. You are great and you are glorious. We thank you for the reminder again in the week that has passed of the wonder of your creation, the beauty of which we see all around us. We praise you for your might and for your power. We acknowledge that even if we had 10,000 reasons listed before us uh, for which to praise you, the list would not be exhausted. We thank you for your goodness and for your faithfulness and we praise and worship you. But we thank you that you are gracious and generous. We confess before you the many ways in which we have failed and strayed from your ways. For we are prone to wander and prone to leave the God whom we claim to love. But we thank you for your free and generous grace that reminds us of the spiritual dangers we face and that urges us to press on to know and to love you more. May that be our reality today. We thank you that though we often turn away from you in weakness and rebellion, you draw us back to yourself. You welcome us even though we have nothing to commend us, and you forgive our sins and our backslidings. Lord Jesus, we thank you that through faith in you, we are clothed in the robes of your righteousness that they were purchased at unimaginable cost to you. We thank you for your life of perfect obedience, withstanding every attack of the evil one. You never wandered or faltered, even while suffering the deepest agony, of bearing the judgment that we deserve for our sins. Thank you for such a great salvation. You have paid the price for our sin, past, present and future. And you have wrapped us safely in the robes of your righteousness. Holy Spirit, melt our hearts with such a powerful love that has been shown to us at the cross. Fill our minds with its glory and help us to live by your truth. Give us faith so that we will see the, the falseness of the world that is passing away all around us. For our every breath comes from you. Give us abundant spiritual life overflowing joy and the knowledge that in Christ we are children of God. So speak to us afresh from your word today and prepare us to live for you in the week that lies ahead. 
Father, we continue to pray for our broken world, for all who are suffering the effects of coronavirus. We pray for our government as they manage the lifting of restrictions this week. We pray for wisdom for all and that our newfound freedom would not be used to ill effect. We pray for the reopening of our churches next week, that that indeed will go well. We pray for safety and for protection. And most of all, for that joy of coming to meet together again as a community of your people. We pray for all who are ill at home or in hospital. And we ask for your hand upon them, for those who are looking after them, and for the doctors and nurses, for wisdom in all the decisions that they have to make in many different and difficult circumstances day by day. And we continue to remember all who are serving you overseas, supported through our United Appeal for Mission. We pray that you would continue to bless them in their work. May they see much fruit for their labour and see your kingdom grow. And we ask for your hand upon the Reverend John. May he know your presence and your strength in these days. We pray all these things together with the unspoken prayers and longings of our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 46. Two very short parables of Jesus. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Amen. And we pray that God would bless to our hearts this reading from his word. Well, when was the last time that you lost something? Maybe you searched for it and couldn't find it. And then when you weren't looking for it, you found it. That happens to me more often than I would like. Maybe it happens to young people at school when they're looking for their homework or for a book. Or adults, maybe it's for a utensil or worse still, some important documentation like a passport or a particular bill. You didn't put it back where it was meant to go and then you can't find it. It's a nightmare, isn't it? In today's very short passage, we have two parables, each one only a few words in length. Jesus is still teaching here in Matthew chapter 13 about the kingdom of heaven. Remember, that means to live under God's rule and his reign. In both parables, something is found. In the first, hidden treasure is found, probably uh, by an employee of the owner of the field. Now, boys and girls, don't be getting any ideas. I'd say you'd have to dig up a fair section of land in Calvin and Monaghan before you'd find any buried treasure. It was different in Jesus' day. In days before banks and safe deposit boxes, people would have hidden treasure in the ground. With the rate of bank closures uh, across the country, we could be back to that. It's not a good idea, so don't try it at home. But Jewish law at the time said if you found such randomly buried treasure, you were entitled to it, except if you were the employee of the owner of the field. So that's what must be happening in this passage. The man who found the treasure must have been an employee of the owner of the land. So with joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. This meant when he bought the field, he bought all that was in the field, including the treasure. And this was permitted under the law. You buy the land and you take what you get with it. For this man, it was worth giving up everything for the sake of the treasure. And Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like that. In the second parable, verses 45 and 46, we meet a merchant looking for fine pearls. Now, sure, how he did that, I'm not sure. Uh, whatever the first century equivalent of eBay or Dundee uh, was or something like that. But he spotted the pearl. Then he went away, sold everything that he had and bought it. He was searching intentionally. The two parables sound so similar. Maybe you're thinking Jesus just said the same thing twice. However, the obvious difference is that one man stumbled upon the valuable thing, 
while the other went searching for it. And isn't that the pattern of how people relate to the good news of Jesus? Some people stumble upon its truth. Maybe they stumble upon it for the first time. Or maybe they've heard hundreds or maybe even thousands of sermons about how they need to trust Jesus and they've never taken it seriously or never seen their need. And then one day, it just clicks. They realise their need to trust Jesus as Saviour. And they do that. The Holy Spirit is drawing them to the truth. Or maybe others search for the meaning of life. The meaning of hope in the face of death. And they read this, that and the other. And they, they, they try this, that and the other. And then the Holy Spirit opens their hearts and minds to respond to the good news of Jesus. But either way, however it is that they end up in this place, both men in the parable appreciate the value of what they found. These men made discoveries, discoveries that led them to make life-changing decisions. Sometimes people have something in their possession that is more valuable than they realise. And maybe they only come to realise how valuable it is when someone says to them, I think that's worth a bob or two. Or when an insurance assessor has to visit and says, hold on a minute. Jesus said the treasure is like the kingdom of God. That means the best thing that can happen to us is to become part of God's family. Have God as our king and start to live lives that honour him. That's the only way to know what Jesus called life in all its fullness. Other things might seem good or fulfilling But this is better. To have Jesus as your king means that you've stopped living your own way and stopped wanting to be your own boss. That you've trusted Jesus through his death and resurrection to forgive your sin and you've begun a new life with him as your king. The gospel message is the most valuable thing, not only that we can know, but rather that we can receive. Receive through personal faith in Jesus. And don't take it for granted, because many people in our world today have never heard of Jesus. But the sad reality is that many who have heard of him treat this offer of God's salvation with contempt or indifference because they fail to grasp its value, both for this life and the next. Now, lots of children's stories and lots of films Talk about finding hidden treasure. And when treasure is found in real life, it always makes the headlines. It's a theme that excites the human heart. But there is no treasure like that of knowing Jesus. So we need to ask today, why is the good news of Jesus so valuable? The truth is, we often only associate value with monetary value. But there are lots of other reasons why things are valuable. Let me explain. The ornaments on the screen are really valuable to me. I don't think they're of any particular significant monetary value, but if you know different, you let me know. And they sit in my house, in my living room, and many of you will have seen them and maybe wondered, why did he get those? You know, they they look really old or whatever. But they came from my grandparents' house. And they're valuable to me because of who gave them. Their source. Then there's my technology devices. Now, to be honest, they're like a creaking gate at the moment. And they're definitely of no retail value. I probably have to pay to get them disposed of. But they're really valuable to me now. And I've needed them so much in recent months to connect with you and to prepare the services week by week. They're valuable because of their usefulness. And then there's my public services card. Now, it's of no monetary value at all, but it's really valuable because of what it allows me to access because of its purpose. The government say that the public services card establishes and authenticates your identity and assists you in accessing public services in an easy and safe manner. It's really, really valuable to me, and I wouldn't want to lose it. These three examples of things that are of value 
but are of no monetary value, remind us that when it comes to the gospel, we need to see why it is of tremendous value. Because of its source. First John chapter 4 tells us, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, to be that sacrifice that turns away God's anger. You see, God's plan to rescue sinners was not an accident, but rather was carefully planned in eternity past. It is the greatest demonstration of his love, that his son would come to die on the cross so that we can be forgiven when we trust him, that by his spirit he would open our hearts and grant us understanding. This is amazing love, overwhelming love, that thou, my God, wouldst die for me, As Charles Wesley said, the gospel is of infinite value because it is a gift from God himself to a lost world. But it's also of infinite value because of its usefulness. Without this salvation, we are lost, hopeless and helpless. Jesus offers us in the gospel what we could never do or obtain for ourselves. Paul reflects on that. In Philippians chapter 3, when he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul said that as he thought about his credentials, his achievements, his heritage, all those other things. He says they're rubbish compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The gospel is of infinite value because it does for us what we could never do for ourselves. What does that mean? Well, it's also of infinite value because of its purpose. Those who trust the Lord are not just forgiven, but brought into his family, into a relationship with him. And one day have access to be with him forever in heaven. That is the greatest thing that this parable is telling us. That when someone becomes a Christian, they gain a treasure that will last forever. This is more wonderful than any earthly treasure. It's more wonderful than all earthly treasure put together. Nothing compares to this. But the question for each one of us is how do we rate its value? But the question for each one of us is do you recognise the value? In the two parables, even though the thing is of value in different ways, the important thing is that both men appreciated its value. What is key is how each individual responds. Finding the hidden treasure or finding the valuable pearl, it would have been foolish not to act upon it. And so too with the precious gospel. To know it and not trust Jesus would be to turn your back on the greatest treasure ever known. The two men in these two parables not only recognised the value of the treasure, but they pursued the prize. They sold all that they had to get it. Now, I've chosen this title carefully because we need to be careful. Jesus is not saying in these parables that we can buy or earn our way into the kingdom. The Bible is very clear on that. And we've already alluded to that in Paul's words from Philippians chapter 3. Having Jesus as our king is worth all that we have, though. Not that we literally buy the kingdom or earn our way into it. People sometimes say, I'll want to get right with God and I'll do whatever it takes. But the truth of the gospel is this. We do not do a thing to lay hold of it. Jesus has done all that is necessary. Rather, we receive his rule and the blessings of his kingdom by grace alone, through faith alone. But having done that, we're called to pursue the prize, to run the race that is before us, as Paul puts it elsewhere. 
being in God's family and having him as your king is to be more important than anything else. From our earliest days, that brings conflict within ourselves, for we want to do what pleases ourselves. We want to set our own agenda and our own priorities. And that could be any myriad of things, from sport or possessions, success or socialising, that seem more important or become a hindrance to following Jesus. Perhaps all those things in and of themselves aren't wrong, more often than that they're not. But they're never meant to take God's place and can so easily lead us away from God if they become our number one priority, the thing that takes all our time and the thing that we're really living for. But these men in the parables gave up everything for the sake of the treasure and the peril. And just as people would have thought that they were mad for doing that if they didn't understand the worth of what they were getting, Why is he selling all to buy that piece of land? Sure, it's not even a good piece of land. So often people watching on don't understand the cost for following Jesus. For some, it will bring scorn and rejection, maybe even from those closest to them. But the gain will always be more than the cost. It means letting go of everything else. And giving up our trust in ourselves or anyone or anything that would merit us right with God. I like how someone said, saving faith is an exchange of all we are for all that Christ is. That Jesus is not saying in this set of parables that we should get rid of all our possessions. But he is teaching about the attitude of our hearts and asking us what is most important to us. The kingdom of God is worth sacrifice. There is a cost to following Jesus. I wonder today, is there something or someone that you wouldn't give up for the sake of the kingdom? The point of the parable is that having Jesus as our king, we give everything over to him. We sell the right to run our own lives and set our own agenda. And when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're not just praying that for out there. We're praying it for in here and in here. When we treasure the kingdom, it makes a difference in the course of our lives. We will want to grow in our knowledge and love of God. We'll want to live out that decision, letting it shape our priorities in every aspect of our lives. We'll be happy to sacrifice our time, to have time to pray, to time to gather with God's people, time to study his word, time to give thanks to the king who gave up his all for us. We want to live by gospel priorities, by seeking to see gospel fruit in our lives, the fruit of the spirit, patience, gentleness, peace, and so on. We want to advance the kingdom by sharing his love with others and inviting them to follow him too. Only when we see the true value will we be willing to count the cost, to take up our cross daily and follow him. It has been said that Christ is supremely satisfying in such a way that if you lose everything else on this earth, but you get the kingdom of heaven, you have a happy trade-off. And nothing in eternity can ever take away this great treasure from the believer. But so many don't see it. Let's turn the parables on their head for a moment. A person makes a discovery of a treasure, decides it's just too much bother to deal with, to adjust their priorities, to make the sacrifice, to secure the treasure. They just leave it lying there. Too often our valuations are completely wrong. We worry and strive after things that are ultimately passing away. The writer C.S. Lewis says that often we're like children who don't know any better, who want to go on making mud castles because they cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of coming for a holiday at the seaside. We settle too easily and too readily, too often, 
or plastic imitation satisfaction. The broken toys of a fallen world that is far from God, that is passing away. And too often we settle for those things rather than the treasure that is freely offered to us each one in the gospel. For many, lockdown may have been a time to pause and to think and reflect on where you've come from and where you're going, on your priorities, on what you've missed and what you haven't. But as we emerge from lockdown, as we wonder about what the new normal would look like, as we ponder and worry about what the state of our economy might look like, may God by his grace enable us each one to reassess the value of the kingdom, the inheritance that is ours in the gospel through faith in Christ, an inheritance that will never perish, spoil or fade, to which nothing nor no one compares. May we reassess and see who is truly worth living for. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, the world is ever near, around us and within. So often we see the sights that dazzle and the tempting sounds we hear. But we pray that by your Spirit, you would help us to see the the worth of what you offer us in the gospel, to commit to Christ afresh and to live wholeheartedly for him, that we give our whole lives to him because he first gave his life for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.